Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this first afternoon session of our Research and Enterprise Excellence Week. After a great session this morning, it's my great pleasure to be able to uh, reintroduce and reannounce Professor Tony Dodd, Associate Dean for Research and Enterprise in the School of Digital Technologies and the Arts, who is going to be introducing one of our new research centres this afternoon. Tony, over to you. Thank you, Tim, uh, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as Tim said, my name is Tony Dodd, Associate Dean for Research and Enterprise in the School of Digital Technology and Arts. And I'd like to introduce to you uh, the Staffordshire Centre for Sustainable and Renewable Engineering. Um, so the UN back in uh, 2015 came up with a, a strategy of how it's going to improve or we're all going to improve the world. Um, and they came up with 17 uh, sustainable development goals of which we're going to focus on three of them, which really helped to drive and motivate um, the centre that we're talking about here. But overall, these 17 uh, sustainable development goals were introduced as a, as a strategy for 2030 for how we're going to address a series of, of massive global challenges, poverty, um, energy, uh, water, food, healthcare um, for everyone across the planet. So these 17 um, development goals are incredibly important. Um, and they, they're actually driving a large amount of the research that is going on across both Staffordshire University, but also universities across the world. Um, so three of these are particularly important to the centre um, that we're talking around um, here. So the, the first of them um, is Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is really around clean energy. And this isn't just around you know, the move to renewables. Um, it's actually even more fundamental than that. As you'll see on the slide, there are still huge numbers of people that don't have any access to electricity um, whatsoever within the world. Um, there are massive challenges around inequality. Um, we're obviously moving more and more towards a more renewable future. We're wanting to produce zero carbon electricity and energy. So there are massive challenges around how we achieve um, all of these um, goals. Sustainable Development Goal 9 um, is then around innovation and infrastructure. Um, and infrastructure, again, is a key part of what this centre um, is about. But it's not just about you know, the infrastructure and, again, around making um, the planet a better place. Um, it's you know, how do we get there? So how do we invest in research? How do we invest in innovation? And highlighted here is an, in, an interesting graph around manufacturing. And manufacturing has seen a steady decline um, pre-COVID. How do we ensure that we have a sustainable manufacturing future? moving forward. And again, this is one of the key aims um, of the, the centre that we are talking around here. And the final area is Sustainable Development Goal um, 11, which is around where effectively where are we going to live? So we have a huge urban population across the planet these days, but a substantial proportion of people are living in, in very, very substandard conditions. So how do we move um, to improving living standards, where we live, um, the conditions that we live in? Um, so again, these are all, um, all challenges that can be addressed through engineering. And if we quickly flip back, I mean, actually all of the, the 17 sustainable development goals will have engineering as a key component of them. But the three that I have highlighted here are particular engineering challenges um, that the centre will be looking at. I think another really interesting aspect of this is the idea of, of the circular economy. So this is a, a graphic from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that, that drives the idea of, of the circular economy. And again, this is really critical to how we will be thinking within the centre. So we have the idea of, of renewables um, on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, how we do consumption and particularly the great growing emphasis, not just on recycling, but on things like refurbishment, re remanufacturing, um, reuse and how we can maintain things for, for longer than we currently do. 
And again, these are all incredibly important motivators for the idea of, of sustainable engineering and ultimately how we end up with a circular economy that is producing far less waste and, and is massively uh, using our resources less than we have done in the past. So how does this all fit into the centre? So it's not just these UN Sustainable Development Goals and this idea of the circular economy. We also have various government and European strategies that are driving the work that we are doing and that we'll be going on to do. So UKRI, the, um, the UK umbrella organisation for research um, and innovation, has clean growth um, and the future of mobility as key parts of its overarching strategy. We've talked around the sustainable development goals and the three particular ones, seven, nine and eleven. Um, that are very much driving what we'll be doing within this centre. We also have within UKRI the Engineering and Physical Researches Council, um, which drives a lot of the fundamental uh, research funding within engineering. And again, they have key to their strategy is, is the move towards clean energy, um, engin engineering in general, um, improving manufacturing, a large part of what it does, and then living with environmental change. So again, there are big um, wins that, that we can derive from engineering in terms of dealing with environmental change, not just in producing renewables. And then finally, Horizon Europe, um, which is the, the latest reincarnation of, of European funding, again has as three pillars of its research, climate neutral and smart cities and adaptation to climate change. And again, these are going to be really critical um, to the work that we will be doing uh, within this centre. And what these drive then ultimately are the three overarching themes of the Centre for Sustainable and Renewable Engineering. So the idea of sustainable manufacturing, renewable and low carbon energy and sustainable transport. So it's sustainability, it's renewability which underpins everything that we are doing and will be doing within the Centre. So what will we actually be doing and, and what are we doing? So starting with sustainable manufacturing, <clears throat> we are working in advanced methods for how we can improve manufacturing processes. So we're increasingly moving away from the idea of, of fixed production lines and the traditional view of manufacturing to being much more flexible, much more reconfigurable. Um, so greater use of things like machine learning, AI, how do we optimise manufacturing to make it more efficient to improve it? Uh, we've all seen a lot of in the news around advanced robotics, and again, they, they play a key part in the, the manufacturing future. And it's also around how do we use materials in different ways? How do we use novel materials to improve manufacturing um, of novel um, components and products? And finally, it's how do we think around how do we design? How do we design products to make them more efficient to manufacture, more sustainable to manufacture. And through all of this, our aim is to improve productivity, to reduce waste, and to improve reliability of both the manufacturing processes, but also the final products themselves. Obviously, renewable and low carbon energy is a really critical part um, of what the centre does. And, and as you'll see from the talks later on um, in the session, it currently provides the lion's share of the work that is going on within the centre. So here, we're very much focused on how we can use novel design methodologies, how we can use advanced modelling techniques and advanced optimisation techniques to produce the next generation of renewable and low carbon energy. Um, and there's a particular focus on small scale, local, both energy generation and energy storage. And I think this is really important because we're seeing a move to a much more decentralised approach to renewable and low carbon energy. Um, we'll see much more smaller scale approaches rather than the large power stations. And also, a lot of the techniques, a lot of the methods that are being developed in the centre are very widely applicable across the world, particularly in underdeveloped countries. And I think this is a real asset of the work that the centre um, is doing and will continue to do. To show you a, just a snapshot of, of the overall, the areas that the renewable and low carbon energy is looking at, and you'll learn much more about many of these techniques later on, these approaches. We're looking at solar photovoltaic, uh, heating, cooling, thermal energy storage, 
move to more um, organic approaches through solar cells and the use of biogas, uh, micro combines of uh, heat and power, liquid energy storage and smart grid systems. The final theme is sustainable transport. And again, we're looking at a variety of methods of how we can then improve sustainability, reducing the environmental impacts um, of transport moving into the future. How will this be achieved? Will this be achieved through a combination of advanced computational modeling, design optimization, and experimental validation and evaluation? And these very much provide the underpinnings for the research that we do within the center. But it's not just around the research. We're also around about knowledge exchange. And we have three um, funded projects that are looking at knowledge exchange and how we interact with many partners um, in industry and within the local region across manufacturing materials and mobility. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, hopefully that's inspired you to, to listen to the rest of today's presentation on the centre. I will now skip through and then pass on to Torfe, who's going to be looking talking around solar cells. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tof Shafai, I'm Director of the Centre for Renewable and Sustainable Engineering. Um, a very warm welcome from all of us here at, this, at the Centre to you all. Um, my topic of talk, as uh, Tony just mentioned, is to do with organic uh, PVs. Um, and to that effect, um, I'm going to start with uh, global warming and talk about uh, the impact of global warming on our uh, environment. Um, as you can see, from year to year, we've got a temperature rise. And this temperature rise has got a lot of impact in terms of our, our sort of livelihood and further development. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, for example, the picture to the left is from Ukraine. And this is uh, something that has been unheard of. Um, we can see the impact on uh, our agriculture and also on our um, um, sort of environment, etc., etc. And one uh, common denominator to it all is that global warming and how we could actually address that. How can we actually change that? Um, to that effect, um, we, 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 we will look at um, anything that is got. Uh, for example, to do with um, uh, fossil fuel and how we could eradicate that to um, sort of uh, produce and uh, have a cleaner environment. Further to that, obviously, by removing all this fossil fuel, uh, hopefully um, there's going to be a, a, a sort of peace return to uh, Middle East. This has been going for quite a long time. Uh, <clears throat> Sun has, is about 4.6 billion years old and it's uh, sort of halfway through its life. So relatively speaking, uh, it's uh, a bit younger than myself. And um, further to that, uh, we, we can see the solar irradiance uh, transmitted to the Earth in one hour would be enough to actually uh, provide the energy for whole, uh, globally for a whole year. Now, um, when during the uh, pandemic, we have all uh, sort of gone through the ordering and um, uh, sort of services to uh, service delivery. And one service that has been delivered uh, since the beginning is the actual sun's ray to air and at no cost. So all you need is the PV system on your roof. And here you go. You can convert that energy. Um, <clears throat> Now, the history of that, uh, history of uh, photovoltaic goes back to 1833, that, uh, which Alexander Becquerel actually um, sort of designed as um, the first photovoltaic device. Since then, there has been a number of improvements, and um, specifically uh, since the um, uh, sort of birth of uh, silicon technology, it has improved quite immensely. Um, PV system, as we know it today, um, began with uh, monocrystalline silicon, which is quite um, a sort of uh, 
a, 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 with a high efficiency, around 25%. And specifically, um, uh, well, the upper limit, uh, limit of that, according to Shockley and Quasi, is about 32%. I doubt very much that we ever get to 32%, but nevertheless, uh, the, the actual um, photovoltaic efficiency of um, monocrystalline silicon is quite high. Um, further to that, we can see the, the cost of uh, uh, sort of uh, production is coming down annually and also uh, the, at the same time as the rate of uh, um, the, the modules uh, production is going up. This is go quite good news and it is good to see so many countries, especially uh, the countries that consume quite a lot of uh, uh, fossil fuel, are actually leading in this way. So this is very important to us. Uh, <clears throat> silicon technology has got some, uh, some drawbacks to it. For example, high temperature uh, purification system at around 1400 degrees C. This is quite um, a sort of uh, a problem because up front you are putting uh, carbon increasing the carbon footprint with 1400 degree C heat. Um, all the processes are also expensive and the manufacturing costs are expensive. And when you look at it, the manufacturer's warranty is about 10 to 15 years. And we also know that annually the solar cells performance are dropping quite fast. Um, now let's go to um, photovoltaic, organic photovoltaic. I'm not trying to be a, a double glazing salesman here, but really it's got a lot of uh, advantages that we need to uh, look at it carefully. Um, large effective mass, so we don't have to um, sort of have, uh, the absorption will be high, so we don't have to have as much, um, so that the thickness of the device is going to be in nanometer rather than in uh, micrometer. Uh, they're easily synthesized, so give a chemist a, a sort of uh, uh, your prescription of what you want, the properties that you want, they could actually uh, synthesize that for you, the solution process. So the fabrication will be at room temperature rather than at the temperature that we uh, discussed earlier. Uh, the fabrication processes are also cheaper and um, because of the low temperature cost and flexible substrate, which is one of the really, uh, really important and semi-transparent. Um, you could roll these and take it to uh, remote areas, take it somewhere that there is no grid connections. And here you go, you can have a standalone system. Uh, the conduction mechanism is it's a little bit different from the conventional uh, solar cell to uh, the, the, the bulk heterojunctions that we apply with uh, organic photovoltaic. Um, I, I'm not going to go to the detail of that, but with absorption of light in the absorbing material, in, for example, silicon, you're going to create a, a pair called electrons whole pair, which we call them excitons. These are um, readily uh, split up and so dissociate, so we, we could continuously pump a negative and positive charge to an external circuit. Now, the situation is a bit different with uh, organic, and uh, we need to introduce another material. As you can see, I've included electron acceptor material. Uh, polymer absorbs and uh, electron acceptors would help the dissociation of these electrical charges. It doesn't matter whether we are looking at um, the, the, the two systems, for example, um, conventional or unconventional approach. In any way, we, we, we have the, the efficiencies are associated with three terms. Obviously, we need to absorb light and create excitons. Excitons have to be dissociated to create uh, electrical charges. And obviously, these have to be extracted to the outside terminal. Um, Therefore, holistically looking at it, uh, the important thing is the material itself. So we need to do extreme um, sort of in-depth knowledge of the material to uh, include, um, to, to be able to produce high efficient system. Over the years, we have used a number of um, organic material, polymers, uh, small organic molecule, fluorine derivatives, as we are, uh, as shown there and also the workhorse of the polymers, P3HD, which is uh, most studied polymer probably on Earth. And um, we have 
got several publications through that which is stated at the bottom. Uh, nevertheless, uh, when we mix this material, you can see at the, to the right is the string in the lower uh, picture. Uh, you've got polymer phase, which is uh, like a string. And also to the left, you, you can see the small organic molecules. Now, when you mix these up, it becomes something like similar to uh, spaghetti bolognese. I tell that to my students all the time. So, uh, in, in a sort of, you, you're going from monocrystalline silicone where everything is, has an order to an amorphous structure and mixture. So from that sense, to what we want to know is how the conduction mechanism, how we could actually get these electrons and positive charges to the external circuit. So we need to know certain information about the depth of the material. Here we've got, for example, um, um, what we have done, we've uh, made an innovative approach in terms of uh, looking at the topography of this, uh, the surface and by chemical etching, each time we're removing 20 nanometer of the surface and we're looking at it from the Raman uh, signal. This would give us a 3D profile of the, uh, the, the, the actual, let's say, 100 nanometer device and we are able to, um, to, 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 to actually have in-depth knowledge of what is happening inside the material. And doing it this way, we have actually um, made a, a really new approach because it, when you look at the graph onto the side, um, there are uh, two devices that with the composition ratio of 1 to 1 to 0.5 and 1 to 2, they have got similar electrical characterization. So which is really important to us, we have been able to get the actual efficiencies and see how the actual um, uh, the, the, the uh, organization within the molecule uh, can actually, uh, in, in the active layer, could actually produce the best results. Um, we have also done similar thing, but this, uh, this time with the X-ray analysis, and we have been able to, uh, to arrive at the same conclusion, which is really important that two different techniques produce the same outcome. Um, <clears throat> the power conversion efficiencies, we are obviously ourselves and any other universities, industries, uh, they're trying to improve the power conversion efficiencies. Uh, I'm very pleased to inform all of you that um, our power conversion efficiencies now reaches at 18.8%. To my knowledge, this is the highest power conversion efficiencies on organic uh, material being observed. Uh, we have, this is, we have, obviously we, got, uh, we have validated this and further to that we have increased this to over 20% now but unfortunately the 20% devices were performed very lately and we have not been able to validate that. Um, this work was um, sponsored by uh, Newton Funding, uh, institutional funds to, with uh, Egypt, Alexander University in Egypt, which we are looking at actually to produce films that, um, plastic films that actually could be rolled and be taken to the uh, remote areas in Egypt and uh, have a look at the uh, um, sort of impact on the social, uh, socio-economic of that country. Um, <clears throat> two different approaches for um, going to large scale we have developed. One of them is being currently um, well, with the laser surface patterning, uh, we are producing small devices. We are connecting all these uh, small devices to become a large device. And also, we have uh, we have done another approach, which is called um, on a larger scale with 30 centimeter square, and that is based on uh, same approach, uh, laser patterning of the surface, but this time in a sort of um, um, we are using spraying technique to actually um, produce the active layer. Now, area of collaborations, we are, um, we, we would love, spe specifically with this COVID business, um, we, we, fundings are going to be scarce and uh, we need to um, collaborate with uh, universities, with industries to uh, progress. 
from that sense, we've got a number of um, lines from uh, material synthesis, green solvent, pre and post fabrication techniques, fabrication techniques itself, electron hole transporting layer, and choice of electrode material. These are the areas that particularly we would be uh, interested in collaborations. And uh, now I um, thank you for uh, um, uh, listening to my um, uh, presentations and I'm going to hand you over to uh, Professor Gohari, my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Tofer. This is Hamid Reza Gohari. I'm Professor of Low Carbon and Renewable Energy Systems with over 20 years of industrial and academic experience in um, energy systems. Um, I've had my education done at uh, the University of Manchester. I did my PhD at Manchester University and my undergraduate and postgraduate at Amir Kabir University of Technology. Um, and now, basically, as a professor of low carbon and renewable energy systems at the Center for Renewable and Sustainable Engineering. Uh, I'm here to, to have my expertise on and to help the society by addressing the main issues we are overseeing in terms of energy crisis and global warming. So my niche of research actually is nowadays on uh, energy technologies and scenarios that can help us to achieve climate change targets particularly the net zero by mid-century. I have expertise on low carbon uh, and renewable energy systems, in particular carbon capture and storage, um, in um, micro combined heat and power systems, and as well as in wind energy and energy storage using compressed and liquid air. Global warming is happening. This is not just a polar bear issue. We have to act now, otherwise, if we are not closing the gap by 2030, it's going to be really late for our globe to, ca to cope with the, with the current level of uh, carbon dioxide, which is over 400 parts per million. This is not just climate change, this is climate emergencies. As you can see, polar bears seeking food near cities nowadays. As good nations came together with Paris Agreement in November 2016, 196 uh, parties, they have decided actually to tackle the issue and to make sure the temperature of globe is not going to go more than two degrees by um, mid-century. And of course, we are aiming to reach to climate neutrality and uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. This is the uh, very recent report from Global Energy Review 2021. International Energy Agency shows that despite a drop in 2020, we see actually an increase in carbon dioxide emission, about 1,500 megatons carbon dioxide emission more than 2020. So things are not progressing according to plan, and we really need to act. How to act? Basically, there are technologies, and there are procedures, there are um, scenarios that can give us the, the right answer to, to this uh, climate change crisis. For instance, IEA report emphasizes that efficiency improvement is going to have a share of about 40% uh, to cl climate change uh, tackling and carbon uh, dioxide emission. Reduction, renewables 35%, and the rest of technologies, including carbon capture and storage, they will have a share of 14%. At Staffordshire Center for Renewable uh, and Sustainable Engineering, we are tackling all the areas of um, technology in order to achieve uh, the required targets. The emission is in all sectors of um, 
of energy from from power from transportation um, as well as industries buildings and so on very recent report just last month IA reported the key milestones to pathway to net zero and the most important part is by 2050 it's important to have 85 percent of building net zero ready more than 90 percent of heavy industries they have to be low emission industries and over 70 percent of electricity has to come from wind and solar so a long way to go this is the what we see in uk electricity day to day there are tracks of what is happening and how combination of energy generations providing uk electricity the target is to reach, reach to 100 grams per kilowatt by 2030 and you can see there is a slight increase uh, unfortunately to emission in 2011. my track record uh, which i can I, i'm i brought actually on board into the center uh, goes back from my experience at Cranfield University and Manchester University all the way through Staffordshire University. We have worked on different scenarios in a UK funded project um, to reach to the, the required target of 80% at the time by 2030. I have worked extensively on carbon capture and storage technologies myself and my team uh, at Staffordshire University. We are experts in uh, all different type of capture from pre-combustion, post-combustion capture as and importantly and more advanced on oxy-fuel combustion. This is one of the projects I worked on. It's a 100 kilo, 150 kilowatt uh, combustor which has converted to oxy-fuel combustion that was part of a 1.7 million project funded at uh, Granfield University at the time. I also work on oxy turbine cycles where we are going to capture CO2 from a gas fired power stations which nowadays they have a, a share of about 40 percent of the power generation the project which I am now working on is to evaluate majority of the different cycles um, oxy turbine cycles this is actually a research project with several publications now we have done process simulation of different cycles and evaluation of how these cycles can be uh, adapted for demonstration or improved furthermore track record of project work on gas ccs there was a funded uh, project to see how we can improve the post combustion capture efficiency by using polymeric uh, membranes very successful project completed uh, in 2016 i also work on carbon storage um, technologies i have several um, students actually working on um, oil and gas recovery using injection of carbon dioxide uh, basically in oil and gas reservoirs so we are killing two birds with one stone storing our carbon dioxide and of course we are enhancing the recovery of oil and gas quite exciting project as you have seen from the IA report energy efficiency improvement is the key actually technology towards the aim of uh, carbon neutrality about 40 percent of carbon reduction share goes to that one we are working extensively on co-generation of heat and power and tri-generation of heat, power and cooling at the same time, which will increase actually the efficiency of our system for, particularly for domestic applications, about 20%. So we can achieve by micro CHP system efficiencies to 95 and plus when considered combined heat and power efficiencies. There are different uh, main technologies in micro CHPs and in particular we are focused on the fuel cell and micro gas turbine uh, technologies as uh, the most clean technology fuel cell and the most advanced technology micro gas turbine systems. 
I've worked on different projects, um, including a two kilowatt heat and power generation systems, um, as well as biomass and biogas, actually, versions of these micro CHPs. Very impressive project, uh, Mitric. Um, we have worked with industry blade on micro turbines, as well as Cranfield University. For the first time in energy industry, we've uh, actually designed, CFD modeled, and built a 12 kilowatt micro gas turbine working on biogas instead of diesel. So you can imagine how a uh, level of carbon uh, emission reduction can be seen as uh, biofuels are considered as carbon neutral fuels. In line with the, with the government to decarbonize a UK uh, natural gas system, we have focused our uh, projects on hydrogen combustion. Um, there are track record, good track record of us working on uh, design of combustors um, running on pure hydrogen or a mixture of hydrogen and methane. We are working with Sao Paulo University in Brazil um, to burn the bio uh, biohydrogen and as well as uh, methane gas which is quite uh, renewable as well as carbon neutral in micro CHP systems. So from waste to power. Another track record we have on com hydrogen combustion in uh, photovoltaic uh, micro channels. We have simulated the, the NOx emission in this uh, type of micro channels uh, while burning um, pure hydrogen. There is another funded project which I'm working on in my research group. It's part of Smart Energy Network Demonstrator. It's called SEND project. It's a European Union funded and UK uh, Research Council funded project. It's about development of uh, props to measure particulates from medium and small size uh, combustors. A quite interesting project and again part of our um, profile of work to reduce emission from burning fossil and biofuels. Clean energy generation without renewable and clean storage wouldn't help. So we have a group of um, our team working on uh, renewable energy storage systems including compressed and liquid air energy storage, which are considered as mechanical energy storage systems, as well as uh, fuel cell technologies. For the fuel cell uh, technology, we have facilities, which I'm going to show you in a moment. We have had proposals with uh, Stumble Technical Universities, as well as with industries, um, which are aiming actually to build a uh, kind of scalable energy storage system, which receives the electricity from renewable sources like vertical wind turbines or solar panels, and is storing that energy instead of storing in batteries and ending up with toxic waste of batteries or um, issue of um, declining the efficiency using liquid air or compressed air to store the energy. We have facilities available to us. Uh, for instance, hybrid energy lab system is a unique facility at Staffordshire University, which works now as part of this um, center for renewable and sustainable engineering. The, the unit works uh, with hydrogen generation um, using electrolysis, storage of hydrogen, fuel cells, wind, as well as uh, solar. And you can have a combination of different technologies and scenarios for students and for our researchers. Quite amazing facility to have access to. We also have a, a wind turbine system for experimental uh, phases uh, and to learn how wind turbine works and how are the parameters to improve the efficiency of wind turbines. We have also recently purchased a 
a, a micro turbine unit. It's a three kilowatt unit that generates three kilowatts of electricity and about 15 kilowatts of heat with efficiency above 94%, quite impressive combined efficiency. And that's in our position, um, industries and students, they can use that facility and aiming to improve it to the hydrogen generation. All these technologies, they have to come together in a smart city and in a smart, actually, uh, network. Uh, we're working on a smart uh, city integration of low carbon and renewable energy systems. And to wrap up, um, we watching the time uh, evolving of carbon emissions. There is no doubt uh, that we are the cause for climate change human activities or we need to act now. If we are not closing the gap by 2030, it would be really late to achieve the target. Uh, there are key milestones for carbon neutrality by 2050 available. As I explained in my uh, presentation, we're working on micro combined heat and power systems on carbon capture and storage technologies on hydrogen uh, utilization for fuel cells and micro turbine as well as energy storage and my final message is Staffordshire Center for Renewable and Sustainable Engineering is going to be a hub for low carbon and renewable energy systems in the region and beyond and we are looking forward to collaboration with all industries um, universities nationally and internationally Thank you very much for watching my presentation. And now I hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Mukimi, to carry on with his uh, presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Amit Reza, for your interesting presentation. Uh, I'm here to present you the concentrated solar power and thermal energy storage and uh, our capacity in uh, this center for collaboration and working nationally and internationally. The layout of this uh, presentation is introduction of my background, energy crisis and solution, concentrating solar power projects and vision, TES projects and vision, possibility for collaborations. Okay, let's start with the introduction of my background. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Mugimi, Associate Professor of Clean Energy Technologies at Staffordshire University. I, uh, my expert is in uh, CFT and optimizations of thermofluid problems for renewable energy technologies, CSPs, as well as uh, thermal energy storage batteries. I have uh, several years of uh, academic and industrial backgrounds, uh, working with different institutes, and uh, I had honor to collaborate with uh, different parties and uh, researchers and collaborators from all around the world, which uh, I listed a couple of them here. Uh, I have a high uh, publication records, uh, more than uh, 60 journal uh, and conference articles, one book, two book chapters, and one ANSYS webinars. And I'm the awardee of Green Talent 2015 by German, uh, German Federal Ministry of Research and, uh, and Education, and I was announced as the, one of the top young uh, scientists under 30s by the uh, German Federal Ministry of Research and Education. Okay, now let's start uh, on energy crisis and go what, uh, to see what the solution is. As you know, uh, globally we are relying on gas, uh, oil and coal, and these uh, energy sources are limited as well as the reserves of these energy sources are not uh, uniformly distributed all around the world. So you can see that mainly these resources are uh, reserved in uh, specific countries which ended up the, uh, to these global warming, extreme weather and uh, sea level rise which you are all aware of it. And the solution to that, it would be renewable energy uh, and relying on renewable energy sources. However, one of the issues of using uh, renewable energy in uh, larger scale is over generations of uh, renewable energy, especially during the day. 
And the curve that you are currently seeing on uh, the screen, it re uh, refers as a dot curve. And as you can see, in 2020 in California, uh, we had a significant overgeneration during the day and in right after the sunset in less than three hours we required more than 13 gigawatts of energy which is massive amount of energy so the solution to this imbalance of between uh, energy generation and demand it would be energy storage however in large scale as you know we cannot rely on batteries because batteries are super expensive and in addition to that the compressed air and the pump they have some uh, limitation and uh, restrictions and due to these issues scientists uh, significantly looking for sources a reliable sources efficient and in, uh, with inexpensive energy storage approach and the main purpose of that is flattening this dot curve as you can see on the screen so the solution to that it would be csp in integration with thermal energy storage and now let's quickly see what the CSP is. So in the upcoming slides, I quickly go through the CSP's project and the vision. And here I have a, a video, a short video, to, uh, which introduces you what the CSP is. I got this video from US Department of Energy channel. And I want to ask my colleagues to uh, play this video. Okay, take the natural heat from the sun. Reflect it against a mirror. Focus all of that heat on one area, send it through a power system, and you've got a renewable way of making electricity. It's called concentrating solar power, or CSP. Now, there are many types of CSP technologies towers, dishes, linear mirrors, and troughs. Okay, have a look at this parabolic trough system. Parabolic troughs are large mirrors shaped like a giant U. These troughs are connected together in long lines and will track the sun throughout the day. When the sun's heat is reflected off the mirror, the curved shape sends most of that reflected heat onto a receiver. The receiver tube is filled with a fluid and could be oil, molten salt, something that holds the heat well. Basically, this super hot liquid heats water in this thing called a heat exchanger and the water turns to steam. Now the steam is sent off to a turbine and from there, it's business as usual inside a power plant. A steam turbine spins a generator and the generator makes electricity. Once the fluid transfers its heat, it's recycled and used over and over. And the steam is also cooled, condensed, and recycled again and again. One big advantage of these trough systems is that the heated fluid can be stored and used later to keep making electricity when the sun isn't shining. Okay, now that you got uh, introduced to this technology, uh, I just uh, wanna quickly go through the collaborations and projects that we did with different institutes. This, in this project that uh, I'm gonna introduce to you, I had a collaboration with DLR Institute of Solar Research in Germany and in this project there were uh, uh, as you were introduced uh, these uh, plants they were filled with molten salt and uh, when the sun sets we have to evacuate the molten salts through the tubes and through the receivers otherwise we would have uh, frozen molten salts which uh, create some issues. In this uh, collaboration, we were asked to do some simulations and uh, help them the, to better understand the uh, idea and uh, to, to, to better understand the behavior of the molten salt, the uh, filling and evacuations from the, uh, the tubes. And for, uh, in that regard, my team and I work on optical simulation as well as uh, some CFD simulation in single phase and two phase in order to better understand what the behavior of these molten salt uh, during the evacuation and filling would be which helps significantly for controlling the system. In the other uh, project that we co uh, collaborated and consulted the uh, SolarSource uh, Australian company, uh, 
this company came up with an innovative idea of a graphic uh, solar uh, tower receiver. However, during the pilot plant testing, they found out that they have some hot spots that uh, graphite uh, burns quickly and then they reached out to us and we did a couple of simulation for them for better design to, uh, in order to improve the performance of this uh, receiver which at the end of the day it significantly uh, helped their, uh, the performance of the system. Okay, now let's uh, check the long-term visions of the CSP in UK. According to the uh, 10 point plan for uh, green uh, energy industry uh, there are significant amount of money there is about 4.5 billion pound which is available in the next 10 years and uh, in our center we can collaborate uh, through different uh, sources as well as consultation to tackle uh, these uh, projects in addition to that, I'm going to cover the TES and what the TES is. TES, as you know, is the thermal energy storage, which is also known as a thermal battery. And for thermal batteries, uh, they, they are uh, very interesting uh, in society because they can be used as a backup energy so sources for system. They can help to uh, uniform the distribution of energy we can have a green and effective thermal and electrical peak shaving with these systems and uh, it's it quite useful for decarbonization and waste, uh, waste heat recovery. And these two technologies uh, that you can see, they were integrated with wind power, with solar energy and they can easily be integrated with any other renewable sources and tackle the intermittencies of these sources. So in the upcoming uh, slides, I'm going to cover the projects that uh, we successfully covered in one of the projects that we collaborated with Imperial College London. We were looking for the simplest, most practical and uh, most affordable approach for improving the performance and charging, charging behavior of these thermal batteries. Uh, and interestingly, when we tackle this issue in comparison with the conventional uh, thermal batteries, we came up with a solution and we came up with a novel designs which uh, improve the performance and uh, charging rate of the, these batteries with seven times we, and we, uh, at the end of the day we had a, uh, thermal batteries of uh, seven times faster charging as well as three times uh, long lasting batteries which was uh, quite impressive for thermal energy storage and thermal batteries. Uh, in other collaboration that we had with uh, University of Nottingham, Belmore Energy, as well as Brunel University, we tackle the energy recoveries, uh, recoveries from the domestic areas and buildings. And for residential areas, uh, we uh, came up with a design to use the, these thermal batteries and mounted it on the radiators of uh, buildings. And after several designs and simulation that we, uh, we made, we found out that our eventual design could uh, store more than 15 hours of energy which it means that you can simply switch off your uh, radiators from 6 p.m. to 9 a.m. every night and you can significantly uh, reduce and cut the cost of your bills uh, for end users which is one of the uh, interesting news for uh, end users. We are uh, uh, patenting this uh, uh, idea and uh, this is one of the ideas that we have and we worked in with our with my teams in uh, Staffordshire University. The long-term visions that we have for TES uh, again according to the 10 points uh, which was uh, published recently by government these are the 10 points for uh, uh, revolutionizing the industry there are more than 15 uh, billion pounds uh, of funding available for commercializing different ideas uh, regarding the green buildings and green finance which perfectly suits with TES uh, applications and uh, their impact would be significant saving on carbon generation and uh, carbon dioxide generations the possibility of uh, the collaboration in our center would be uh, based on the expertise and the team that we have. Th we would be capable of supervising and co-supervising different postgraduate uh, projects. 
applying for different research funding uh, uh, nationally and internationally and also consulting the industries and different uh, companies in order uh, for going and revolutionizing their industries. Thank you so much for attending this presentation and at this stage I'm gonna uh, pass it to my colleague uh, Dr. Suleiman to carry on with the presentation. Thank you so much. Hi, I am Abdel Hamid Suleiman. I am an associate professor in signal processing and telecommunications. And as a postgraduate research student lead in engineering department, I have 31 years experience in, uh, in academia and in industry, industrial field. I'm involved in several projects uh, externally funded projects through EU or uh, national level. I am the founder of the Smart and Intelligent Systems Society. Today I will represent my team, the uh, smart, syst uh, smart System team. Our aim is to harness different technologies to contribute to finding solutions to the challenges in the energy sectors. We have many technologies starting from Internet of Things, robots, RFID technology, wireless sensor network. We want to harness all of these technologies to build a system to manage and to monitor the, uh, uh, the energy uh, applications. This system, it will be uh, uh, judge it if, uh, if it is smart or not based on its behavior, actions, and the decision. But the system will not be able to give us a smart decision without acquiring the required data. Then we will build our system starting by acquiring the data. Then to take the decision, we need to have a analysis to, to add the analysis and processing and then we'll be able to take the suitable dis decision. After that, to be able to manage and to control the data flow, we'll need to connect these parts to each other. We're using different technologies based on the scale of my system. If it is in room, maybe it will be uh, technology like Wi-Fi. But if we are talking about cross-country or international level, maybe we'll use 5G or something like that, or satellite communication. At the end, we cannot take the required functions from this system without adding the, one of the main layers, the software and the programming. Hardware now is not enough, only is not enough. We need to add the software and the programming. Then we will acquire signals from the energy application, the energy area, processing it, take decision to monitor and manage, manage uh, our applications. Do we need all of these technologies to serve the energy sector? Let us see the challenges, what we want to enhance in, in, in uh, energy sector. We need better efficiency, we need uh, uh, better resources management, cost, we need more uh, lower cost, we need uh, to reduce uh, air pollution and its effect on environment and to improve the system reliability. And we have many challenge is the change. Now the change in uh, energy sector is uh, highly dynamic, it's changing every day. Let us see some of these changes now. For example, current from production point of view, we were based on few large power plants. Now we are moving to use uh, l many small power producers. Uh, also, currently from market point, point of view, currently most of the uh, countries based on centralized pattern and mainly non-renewable energy, but we started to move to be decentralized and we started to have more resources sources and then we are moving now to distributed uh, pattern 
And in this case, we will move to renewable energy, and we started already in this step. Then we are moving from centralized to decentralized to distributed. All of this management, all of these systems needs accurate management to be able to get the maximum of our power sources. Also, as a change, normally we have supplier and user, and the supplier always feed user with energy, then we are talking about unidirectional energy, energy flow. But now we have the bidirectional energy flow. Supplier can feed, the, can feed uh, uh, users with energy and the same, at the same time, user can produce energy and feed back to the national grid. Sub user not passive anymore, user is active and they can contribute to the network. And all of this process needs management, it needs a control, it needs calculations. We will be able to, pr to produce these functions or to manage these functions. Then the answer for all of these challenges is the smart systems. We need to build a system to be able to manage this relationship between uh, 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 producers and uh, users and to enable matching of energy supply and the demand from uh, a holistic point of view. About the smart systems scales, smart system scales it really can start from very small to manage only energy through building or home and it can go for better uh, for larger scale medium scale to manage factory or to manage uh, compound uh, or can goes to higher level or bigger level to manage city or town and the international level to manage the international based on one country or multi-country over several countries. Then a smart cities, uh, sorry, a smart systems really can manage a smart starting from a small building till the whole universe. For that reason, we need really to harness these technologies very well to be able to do that. If you are seeing a practical example for international level and the national level, the image uh, in the left here, you can see uh, a control room in China. And uh, here they can monitor and control all ultra high voltage line and renewable energy use. And the image in the right showing us the, hier the uh, hierarchical uh, system for uh, controlling and the management system based on inter cross country system from NEC. Also, not only big projects we can work on it international wise over several countries, we can work in a smaller uh, level. We can work in home to be able to control equipment, our devices while we are outside home to be able to schedule them uh, to be able to rely in more uh, s uh, local generated energy like solar uh, technology uh, also to uh, to, uh, to to energy for energy uh, optimization based on the rooms and the home occupation thank you very much now, uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Alison Griffiths, we will talk to us about uh, the smart grids and the smart grids. It is part of uh, smart systems and it is, 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 it is the heart of our system now. Dr. Alison. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Alison Griffiths and I'm going to talk about smart grids. It's a follow on for everyone else's um, talks today. So everyone else's work can feed into the smart grid. So a little bit about me. I've been working for the university for about 20 years. Before that, I started my career in the electrical industry. 
I'm an associate professor in electronic and communication engineering. So I converted to electronic and communications. So now I've gone full circle and I'm concentrating on using my communications knowledge and experience in the smart grid. So the contact details are shown here. I'm also um, the IET Northwest Midlands committee member and also a student staff advisor. So we've all been we've been hearing about the electricity trends and how in the, the demands are increasing. Just wait, just stand up a second and think about this. So in the last 30 years, the demand for energy has more than doubled. So that's just 30 years, double the energy. So this is even more apparent. It's going to be increasing in the future. So we do really need to um, take this seriously and um, think about how we're generating this energy. So in the UK, obviously we've got, I've got statistics, I can show statistics for the global um, renewable energy uh, production. However, at the moment there is about 25% of the energy production is renewable. Just taking the, the, um, the UK as an example, you can see that it's gone from about 5% 30 years ago up to almost 40% up to the end of 2019. So basically we need to address this problem. So we do this with a smart grid. So the first question is, is how is a smart grid different to the traditional grids? So in a smart grid, as also my colleagues have said, then we can gen we're generating more renewable energy and also the consumer ha is producing the energy and that it's a lot more distributed network. So the, it, it, it's a two-way thing. We need to have a lot more sensors. We need a lot more remote control and we need to use intelligence by collecting all of these sensors. So use artificial intelligence to help us to, 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 to use this information and, and to enable us to, to, to use the renewable energy to the most effectively that we have. So we use smart generation, so we optimize the power generation and we feed this back to, pe to, to different parts of the grid. So we, we, we want to automate as much as we can and we want to, um, we want to integrate the renewable generation sources into the grid. So we, we're going to use, or we, we, we foresee that we're going to use artificial in intelligence. So we will therefore be able to change, for example, for wind turbines, the wind can change in real time and we might want to change the angles of the blades or the direction that they're facing. Now, these wind turbines may be local on a person's house or they may be in the middle of the ocean and they may be a cluster of wind turbines as well. We can also use energy forecasting. So by having lots and lots of sensors over the smart grid, then we can forecast the predicted energy and best use the, or best utilize, the, or best utilize the renewable sources to go to the right places. As was mentioned in a, in a talk earlier, that um, obviously with the solar energy, that a lot of the demand is in the evening and it, this could perhaps be diverted from somewhere else um, in where, where it's not evening um, because storing the, the, the renewable sources with, within batteries is, is an expensive um, thing to do. So I'll now look at a couple of examples, projects that we have running or have finished 
and we're developing further. So one of these is the intelligent ultra high speed protection for DC grids. The first question is why DC grids? You may have heard of HVDC. So there are a number of offshore wind farms and the power needs to be transported for, for long distances. Um, traditionally, we use AC for distribution of power. However, after a distance of 50 kilometres, this becomes um, not un uneconomic. Um, so we're looking at HVDC. However, when we use HVDC, then the traditional protection schemes that are used on the AC system aren't or are not haven't, haven't been tried out. They've been designed for AC and not DC. And the, the major thing that happens is the fault current rises at a much faster rate for a fault in a HVDC system than it does for a HVAC system. So we need to have a real time or, or a, a reaction if there's a fault of less than 0.5 milliseconds. Now, this is really interesting project because it was in collaboration with Gene Stafford, which is where I started my apprenticeship. So I had a background in AC protection. Now, because of this really fast um, reaction time, we need, to, we need to look at some prote protection that doesn't have communication. So we need to look at um, something that known as distance protection. So we want the relays, the, the correct relays to trip because we don't want to trip out the wrong sections of the grid unnecessarily. It's called grading. So we want the, the relays that are facing inwards on the screen to, we want, we want the fault one to be a trip and a fault the fault at fault two to not be a trip. So this project look, is look, well, looked at um, a simple way of looking at the characteristics of an internal fault, which is fault one, and an external fault, which is fault two. So we did observe a number of things. So we observed that the magnitude of the power is different for an internal and an external fault, so the rate of change of the magnitude. So we used a differentiation technique and we did, we have produced several um, outputs and conference papers and journal papers on this. We're also looking at um, improving this um, speed of um, reaction to the fault because as there's more and more or more density of um, HVDC on the grid, then the, the, the speed needs to be um, improved. So we're looking at um, a simulation, oh, sorry, D DSP, DSP um, and wavelet and perhaps machine learning. So the other, the next project is demand side management in smart grids, because obviously smart grids are huge. Um, we can look at different areas in the future, but we've decided that um, on this project that we're looking at demand side management. So uh, we're developing a deep neural network based model for demand side man management because we want to predict the demand and enhance the renewable use wherever we can. And we also would like to, um, oh, he, he, here is um, the, some of the reasons, the technical reasons why we would do this. So th this is, a, this is a, a project that is just starting up. And um, we, we, we basically want to look into the technical areas of this. So we want to improve the balance. So we, we were trying to use communication techniques to enhance the quality of, of and the voltage, the quality of the power um, that, that's delivered to all customers around the world, because not everybody has got a stable um, connection to the grid. So this is in its early stages at the moment. So another project 
is um, looking at modeling the efficient and, eco and economic energy model for a remote community. So this is to, th th this is to um, look at a house and um, trying to make it rely on DC power and it would have its own PV system with battery storage and also charge up a car because in these um, remote locations there are many power cuts and 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 the, and and, and, and what they want to do is to learn from the the the, um, the fact that in the in the UK that we have um, implemented 25% of renewables to to use it in, in 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 other remote locations where their connection to the grid isn't as good. So they want to um, model uh, um, the system and um, improve the connection to the grid. Okay, so we are, we're, we're going to completely model this. And I would like to thank you for listening. And I'll pass over to Demetrius, Dr. Demetrius. And thank I'll you, leave him pronounce his surname. Thanks, Alison. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and let me move to my presentation and uh, I'm going to be trying to act as the person that will try to stick everything together. So uh, very humbly, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely happy to, to be here again with all uh, these great people that spoke before me talking about research in renewables, in sustainable engineering and as a materials engineer, which I am, uh, I'm going to try to stick everything together with my research. So one way to do this is to go to several applications. The other way which I chose for this presentation is to take a deep dive in one of the problems that we might face. So I will try to present to you an approach uh, in order to solve an industrial problem. So we are going to talk about how we engineer biomimetic multifunctional smart materials. So the outline of the talk is first, we will introduce an industrial problem uh, we'll talk about the theory and why we do all these things. We'll try to find and steal uh, some ideas from nature. Uh, we'll try to make a solution work using fabrication techniques and uh, using uh, science. And we will con conclude and see if we manage to solve this. So first of all, let's think of a problem. Since we talk about photovoltaics, uh, in general, we all know that photovoltaic panels uh, exist. We all know also that glass buildings exist. And what do they use as a material? They use either glass or a plastic that is almost like glass. Its uh, commercial name is plexiglass, or you might have heard it as perspect, uh, but its real name is polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA. So these two kinds of materials have similar problems. So what are the problems? Uh, think about it. And why do we use them in the first place? Why does it make sense to use a glass? Why does it make sense to use a transparent material? Obviously, we want to take advantage of their good optical properties of these materials, uh, which allow the sunlight or the wavelengths of uh, uh, of light to enter uh, towards our solar cells. So what are the problems? Are there any problems? First one is the reflectance of the sun. Have a look on the video. Melted on the street below, 
chunks of pavement and blistered, and some have managed to fry an egg. The carpet of this hairdresser is even smaller. So, you can see, sunlight can be a massive problem if we don't treat it very well. If we disregard the reflectance, then we might have massive problems, especially in big areas. So, we don't want this sunlight to reflect, we want this sunlight to pass through and actually not diffuse, but be effective towards our uh, solar cell. A second problem course is that all these are uh, affected by the environmental conditions. The dirt, the grease if they are in the cities, uh, the moisture of the surface and what happens is actually this thing that you can see in the picture. So there's a lot of uh, dirt sticking on the surface. So it's very well known that especially in photovoltaic parks uh, there are cleaning problems and you need to actually clean them quite often. Uh, how do we solve these things? Well, in general, we need to cut down the problem. First of all, we need to make an, a surface that is anti-reflective. Second, we need to make a surface that is non-sticky. Third, we need to actually make the surface clean itself. Is that possible? And in the end, and most difficult, we need to combine all these things together. How do we do it? It's a very difficult task, but we have a friend who can help, and that is nature. We can follow nature's example. So, how does nature make surfaces anti-reflective? There is a very uh, well-known effect that's called the Mothai effect. Why? Because the moth, the night butterfly, as we say, uh, was discovered that it has amazing properties in its eye. Uh, what happens? It actually doesn't reflect light at all, and that allows it to move around in the dark, uh, both because the light is directly traveling through its cornea and it can see very well, and second, it doesn't get detected by the predators. Why does this happen? It's because of the structuring that you can see in the uh, right pictures. People have managed to analyze the structures and see that they have micron and nanoscale uh, dimensions. When we make structures like that, we can actually have an anti-reflective surface. Remember, anti-reflective doesn't mean it will diffuse light. It will allow the light to pass through. That makes it optically better. How does nature make self-cleaning surfaces? That is another effect. That is the lotus effect. The lotus is the big leaf that we can find in lakes and rivers. You can see the top left image. And this is very, uh, it's very well known that it's non stick towards water. The droplets of rain actually move towards the center because also of the shape of, of uh, the lotus. That allows the lotus to clean itself from dust and dirt 
that is found on top of it. If we make a surface that is like the lotus, then we have a self-cleaning surface. But what does the lotus have? It has micron and nanoscale roughness. That sounds familiar with the under-reflected surfaces. But also, simultaneously, it has the appropriate surface chemistry. So it is chemistry combined with structuring of the surface that make it to repel water. If you make a surface like that, with the appropriate chemistry and the appropriate roughness on the surface, you can make it super hydrophobic. And that is very well known for many years. How did we manage to do it? We actually found a very easy and fast method to structure the surface. And then on the second step, we changed the chemistry uh, to repel water. So the structure of the surface can be done by many ways. Uh, we, we depends on the lab. So we chose plasma etching, which had a lot. Uh, the structures achieved, as you can see in the pictures, are having dual or sometimes triple scale roughness. And it is, they look very, very rough. Uh, this is a uh, scanning electron microscope. And uh, these are very, very zoomed images. In reality, these are very transparent images. Uh, trying to see what we have achieved with this roughness, we used a sphere that allows us to measure the reflectance. This sphere allows us to measure not only the specular reflectance, which is actually the direct reflectance, but it allows us to measure the diffusion and the total reflectance of the surface. So if you can, if you can focus on the left uh, plot, you can see that we have a lower reflectance being achieved in one of these rough surfaces. The same applies in the case of a coated glass. Similar case, we have achieved uh, anti to, to increase anti-reflectivity of the surface. How about repelling liquids, not only water? Uh, we mentioned how we do it. We actually make a self-assembly monolayer that is uh, fluorocarbon on top of our rough surface. And if you notice the uh, picture on the right, you can see the bottom droplets being more round than the top ones. If you really, really notice the picture, you can see that you can clearly see what is written below the bottom slab and not so much on the top slab. We improved the transmittance, which is different than, the, which is opposite than the reflectance of a, a very good optical material. So reflecting on what we did, did we manage to solve the problem? Partially, we have improved the material. We have managed to improve it, its reflective behavior, and we have managed to make it around 20 to 30 percent anti-reflective. That is a big deal concerning that uh, polymethyl methacrylate and glass are excellent optical materials and they already are very transparent. We have managed to make it repel water and oils, and that is a self-cleaning surface. And we have managed to make this only through a single process. So I think it is quite a successful solution. Closing my uh, presentation, uh, I would like to say that there are many different other projects that we can work on. Uh, in this institute. Uh, this is just an example. This is a case study of something that is a very practical industrial application. And uh, that is all for my presentation. And I'm going to give it back to our director, uh, Professor Safai. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Dimitrius. Um, now this concludes our uh, live presentations and what we're going to do is to, for the next session you're going to have a look at some of, um, some of the uh, laboratory and facilities and also uh, presentations that uh, is pre-recorded and it's going to be shown to you right now. Thank you. My name is Sahal Chameleon and I'm one of the lecturers in the engineering department focusing on electrical utilities and power system engineering and the areas that I focus and research on are related to integration of renewable energies, specifically uh, PV technologies for grid connections and power generation. When I did my PhD was on uh, solar cells, so, um, particularly on organic or polymeric solar cells. Uh, but as I picked up as a full-time lecturer at Staffs Uni, I've been very much interested into uh, utilising the technology of PV and the generation of electricity from them and how we can actually get them connected to the grid or for remote and standalone areas where we can utilise that power generated on a larger scale in order for us to be able to um, use that power for connecting up real applications and real uh, appliances. There is a lot more uh, students who are, are showing more interest towards the renewable energies in, in general. Uh, we can see the number of students who are taking on the electrical pathways at our undergrad as well as our uh, master's degree uh, for uh, electrical and renewable energies has increased uh, compared to previous years. Some of the uh, practical works that we, that we do and I'm in, uh, practically involved in is using software and hardware utilization of predicting and analyzing uh, the behavior of uh, PV systems. Some of the softwares that we use, uh, in, uh, which is part of the facilities we have in these research centers, are including our simulational softwares, such as PVSYS, where we can use these software uh, for um, designing and developing uh, a whole grid connection or a standalone system itself, where we can uh, model and look into the sizing uh, of, the, of the PV arrays and the PV farms. Some of the facilities that we have in our research center uh, includes uh, a small scale, uh, real size uh, PV panels that we have on, on our currently in our science building roof. Uh, we have two types, we have uh, fixed panels and uh, panels that are on a tracker and they're connected uh, into our uh, renewable energy laboratories that we're in station at the moment and uh, we can monitor and record the data that's been generated from them. They are also connected into uh, a controlling charge as well as um, a sort of a DC to AC inversion uh, where we can monitor the behavior of the system as a whole. We also have facilities for um, DC power loads and uh, AC or DC um, uh, power generation where we can replicate uh, the condition of a PV panel uh, producing electricity and we can further investigate and design and develop those inverters using the facilities we have in the uh, centre. I think one of the, this, this uh, area of research is, is one of the critical areas uh, within the renewable energies. Some of the main important parts of this um, uh, focus of the research on this particular area and topic is uh, the global demand requirement for the integration of renewable energies and the use of uh, clean energy resources will actually put Stafford University at a place where we want to be further investigating and getting more involved in the research side as well as getting involved with the industry in order for us to develop uh, new technologies and perhaps optimize existing technologies. So our students normally get involved uh, with the projects that we're, we're doing at the research level. Um, we tend to um, put a lot of uh, research-led um, activities that's going on into our teachings. We also have uh, research-informed teaching that's taking place as a whole, um, where we tend to take most of our uh, recent developments and research uh, findings that we get from the research center and sort of inject that into the teaching modules. Uh, but students also find it very interesting to um, take up the opportunity to uh, further develop their skills that they've gained and uh, with proper uh, training and the requirements for the research modules that we do and get involved and actually do something that is quite novel and be part of that uh, sort of experience that they're going to go through as a student. As long as I remember, I've always been interested in engineering topics. Uh, in particular, I've always been interested in uh, energy engineering and uh, topics related towards energy and renewable energies. Um, and this is why I've, I've, I've done most of my uh, higher education related in this field. And it, it gets me very excited to know that what we're doing here at Staffs Uni and then in this research centre is making an impact. Uh, depending on from time to time, sometimes these impacts are small and large as always research is, is, is dealt in that way. 
Uh, but knowing that even the, 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 the tiniest work we do or the largest work we do can actually have a contribution, it's something that, that drives me personally and motivates me to, uh, to do more work, to get more involved in it and also look for future collaboration. I'm Ash, uh, I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher uh, working in the Thin Film Lab uh, for about five years. Uh, what we are actually doing in this uh, Thin Film Lab is uh, to fabricate and make a new sort of plastic uh, electronic devices. Uh, that is the kind of uh, new approach of uh, the electronics. We're actually fabricating the organic solar cells here. Uh, the techniques that we are using here uh, is uh, quite far away. Uh, from the current uh, techniques that uh, currently we will be using on to fabricating the uh, silicon technologies. Uh, the technique is uh, very, very simple and uh, it doesn't need uh, to uh, use any expensive or uh, also complicated uh, equipments uh, that uh, currently are using in the uh, silicon industry. The stage one as a SETU is just uh, to uh, dissolve the materials, the chemicals, the organic uh, uh, you know, uh, materials, uh, small organic molecules. Uh, we have to dissolve them with a compatible solvent. Uh, once that's done, the next stage is just bring them inside the nitrogen glove box to do the rest of the methods inside the nitrogen glove box. Uh, we're using the spin coating technique, spray coating techniques, and all that sort of uh, techniques uh, to uh, uh, to fabricate the layer by layer of our uh, devices. Our metallization rig, or it's better to say that thermal evaporation chamber, is uh, purposely designed uh, to, be, to be fitted inside our the nitrogen glove box in order to avoid any contamination with the oxygen step by step that when we just uh, doing the fabrication of our organic solar cells there. Uh, once our uh, total uh, device has been created, we have uh, to go further back at the middle section of the nitrogen glove box where we have our uh, AAA certified solar uh, simulator is the techniques to uh, measure and test uh, our uh, final uh, devices to find out uh, how our device is going to be efficient and what is uh, electrical properties of those uh, devices and uh, that's the uh, first of our investigation to find out uh, at some point why our device is going to be more efficient and at some point uh, they are not. So we have to investigate and find out the bulk and also the surface of the uh, the devices with using lots of techniques uh, applied on them, such as uh, optical absorption, the X-ray, uh, the Raman spectroscopy, uh, the, um, measuring the thickness of the uh, device, and also in terms of the morphology, we're going to uh, do the very accurate techniques, we call it AFM, atomic force microscopy techniques, uh, in order to uh, have the accurate surface pattern of our uh, devices. When you want to compare the, the silicon-based material with the organic source material, there are lots of beneficiaries there. Uh, uh, the, the organic materials is a color-based, so you can change the color in every uh, color that you want. You can stick them in the windows of your building. Uh, you can uh, have the flexible uh, layer of the organic salt muscles so you can attach them in your bag, in your uh, t-shirt, in all your uh, clothes and th these are all things that can lead you uh, to go for organic materials. The most important thing is that uh, the, uh, the cheap uh, production cost uh, for organic materials is that for the silicon based material the cost is uh, quite high uh, because when you have your raw uh, silicon uh, material uh, in the factory you have to uh, you know use a kind of the oven kind of the furnace just going up to about 1400 degrees and that's quite uh, costly for the uh, manufacturer for going that but organic material is a kind of a natural material based uh, so you can find it anywhere in your life and you can use them just working in this uh, research uh, center as the topics of the center is just uh, titled by the 
renewable and uh, sustainable engineering. So we all gather together to, to, uh, to lead this way. So if we go ahead with that uh, research topic and have uh, been able to reach the best efficiency of organic solar, so that could be, that could be the highest you know, um, achievement around the world uh, in terms of organic solar. So actually, we have uh, reached uh, the best efficiency of our uh, devices and is going to be published uh, uh, probably not so far uh, future. My name is Bahamin. I joined Staffordshire University since three years ago. Here I joined as a postdoc researcher. We work on MyTrack project uh, so to design a renewable energy combustor. Uh, so it was an industrial-led project between uh, the Staffordshire University, Cranfield University, and the Blade of Micro Turbine in Coventry. We used uh, mathematical models to develop a micro turbine combustor that could normally operate with biogas fuel and other renewable fuels. Because the company intended to shift from, uh, let's say, conventional fuels to the low carbon fuels like biogas. And there's a potent market in the South Africa, and the company in, uh, intends to invest there. That's why so this project was defined and it was founded by Innovate UK. So this part of the lab was used for students to learn about low carbon and renewable energy systems. Uh, as you know, most of the energy we have on Earth is based on the sun, the energy is coming from the sun. So we try to harness this kind of energy. So we develop some kind of renewable systems like wind turbines, uh, solar panels, and fuel cells and put the students into groups. The students uh, need to come to the lab and try to assemble the, this renewable device themselves so they can learn how this kind of device is going to operate and what's the response of this renewable lab and what's the response of this renewable system uh, on the different operating conditions. This part of the lab is mostly used for teaching, but we have some kind of device for uh, research as well uh, and you can see we have a wind turbine and a fuel cell. It's very important because uh, you know the UK is a forefront of uh, using and application and deployment of renewable energy system. So investing and researching on renewable energy is very important, uh, especially at Staffordshire. So because Stoke is located in Stoke and Trent, Stoke and Trent is a hub. So it's very important for us to invest on renewable energy, uh, especially because uh, this part of the country is very as a very potent market and as a very potent, let's say, background for industry, for industry to, in, to invest on. That's why we are going to shift from the conventional systems to a low carbon and energy systems. So we have students from the UK and from other parts of the Europe. The work uh, that I'm doing, I'm delivering the module, uh, low carbon and renewable energy. So for the assignment of these students, I'm trying to deliver the concepts of let's say wind turbines, solar panels and fuel cells. So what's their component and how they operate and uh, so what, what, what would be their re response under different conditions. For that kind of uh, work, we need to uh, scale up because what we have here is just a small version of these renewable systems. So if we are going to talk about these renewable system in a broader sense, so we need to uh, scale them up I think our approach, because uh, manufacturing of these devices are usually costly and very expensive, so our approach is to use the mathematical models and, let's say, using the software rather than making themselves here and uh, try to see their response under the different operating conditions. Okay, so in Staffordshire University, we have the facilities for the students uh, to learn about renewable systems. We have softwares. So we have also good members of faculty who can deliver the softwares, who can teach the softwares very well. So the students uh, here uh, will be familiarized with both softwares use application of the math mathematics in a practical sense so they can learn how they can use, for example, softwares to do research in renewable systems. So that's, that's our approach in doing so. I think the future of the work is very bright. I think we need to apply for more funds and grants so in order to absorb some kind of, let's say, investment from the government so we can improve ourselves, we can improve our, let's say, facilities and the human resources, especially for absorbing so talented people, talented students here, so we can advance our work further. 
and we can, let's say, do more research and develop more renewable systems for the UK society or for the for other part of the world in general. I believe uh, the talented people, if they are uh, coming here, they can do more and they can improve uh, the good for the society, good of the society of the UK especially. My name is Hossein Sheikh. I am a researcher at uh, University of Staffordshire. I am working on design and manufacture of hot end of micro gas turbine, including the combustor, heat exchanger and the turbine duct. The target of the project is to redesign the hot end of the gas turbine, the heat exchanger, combustor and turbine duct to reduce the size, improve the efficiency without compromise the functionality of the gas turbine. In general, additive manufacturing has loads of different benefits, but in specific for this project, I want to mention two main uh, advantages of additive manufacturing over the conventional method. First of all, it gives freedom to the designer by having the capability of manufacturing complex parts like lattice structure and internal cooling channels. The designer has a freedom to design different, different shapes and different parts and quite complicated structures. On the other hand, we can combine multiple parts of one component and reduce the number of parts to one single part using the part consolidation capability of additive manufacturing. Then we can reduce the volume and the size of the gas turbine and make it more compact. Manufacturing sector is one of the highest greenhouse gas emitters, counting 11% of emission is from manufacturing sector in the UK. All the manufacturing processes need to be optimized and improved and the manufacturers need to enhance the operation and process lines. Achieving the goal of uh, Paris 2015 Paris Agreement, clean energy manufacturing means reducing the amount of energy and material waste during the processing of raw materials to the finished product. We can achieve this goal by using uh, cutting-edge advanced manufacturing processes like additive manufacturing. At the same time, we have access to gas turbine, micro gas turbine called micro CHP, which produce three kilowatts of electricity and 15 kilowatts of heat. From emission point of view, this project is quite important to reduce the amount of um, carbon dioxide emission and NOx emission from the micro gas turbine because by uh, reducing the size and by in increasing efficiency, adding heat exchanger, designing, using the additive manufacturing capabilities for compact heat exchanger, we can improve the efficiency of the system and reducing the carbon dioxide emission. Here in Staffordshire University, we have access to advanced design packages and also to modeling and simulate. We also have the license of uh, different modeling packages for uh, CFT modeling, process modeling and performance modeling. In manufacturing side, we have wide range of 3D printers and additive manufacturing machines. We can print wide range of plastic and uh, composites like ABS and nylon and other sort of plastics. And also we, we can print um, metal parts like uh, nickel-based super alloys, stainless steel, titanium parts and all sorts of different metals for different applications. We, having access to 3D printers give us the uh, um, capability to, uh, first of all, we can, we can redesign, design and redesign the part using our simulation packages just to make sure that the final design is going to be work uh, as efficient as possible. But having access to additive manufacturing machines give us the opportunity to uh, make the prototypes quite quickly with the minimum cost and at the same time running the test and change the design if, if it's required uh, quite quickly. By, by having access to all these um, facilities here, we can help other companies and manufacturers to optimize their product and work more productive, uh, more efficient and effective. Global warming and pollution is, uh, is the biggest problem for our generation and also the next generation. And I think uh, research institutes and universities' duty is to get involved in uh, reducing the amount of pollution, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases, help the industries to uh, overcome the global warming problem.
Okay, a big thank you to all our presenters um, this afternoon. I've got several questions here that um, um, some, um, some people have actually uh, on the chat line left, left for us. Uh, the first one is to, um, I think it's your area, Hamid Reza, it's based on achieving net zero. Would that be a reality? And if so, how can we help? Thanks, Dorfe. It's a really uh, a good question. Basically, greenhouse gas emissions, majority of that emission comes from energy sectors, from power, from industries, from transportation, and from buildings. If we apply low carbon and renewable energy technologies in different sectors of energy, uh, production and generation, of course, we are able to achieve the, the net zero targets. This includes heavy industries like cement, iron or chemicals, or glass industries, uh, green buildings, um, electric vehicles and transportation in general, and carbon capture and storage. I want to emphasize on the role of some helping technologies like uh, bioenergy carbon capture and storage. When we capture CO2 from uh, biogas or biofuel burn systems. So if we work all together and apply all the uh, implementing all key milestones in the pathway to net zero, according to different scenarios of power generation and energy production, of course, we are able to achieve that, but we need to act now. How we can help? In the center of renewable and sustainable engineering at Staffordshire University, we are ready for collaboration worldwide with different institutions, with different uh, industries. If you have any project idea, um, you can help, you can, come to us, contact us, and of course we are able to, to provide solutions. We have some ideas where the industry can help us in bringing funding of research further. And this is a collaborative work. We cannot do it uh, but, uh, on ourselves, but a collaborative work all around. This is doable, one, but we need to act right now. Okay, um, thank you very much. And the second question is, uh, is for you, Tony. Um, it's from uh, Global Foundation, uh, stating that how could they access support from our centres? Thank you, Torfa. And I think following on from Hamid Reza's answer, you know, it's, it's very true that we have to work in collaboration if we're going to uh, solve these problems. So if anyone out there would like to collaborate with us, um, on any projects around sort of sustainable and renewable engineering, then I think the easiest way is if you email research services at staffs.ac.uk. Um, that will go to the research managers there who can then get in touch with the relevant people within the centre um, and we can set up meetings to discuss potential collaboration. Um, and these you know, can be collaborations around the more research ends, um, sort of funded by the research councils, through to the more knowledge exchange um, aspects of the, the type of work that we do. So I strongly encourage you to get in touch with us and we can see how we can collaborate. So thanks for the question. Back to you, Torfe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the last question is actually aimed at me, and that is uh, how we are going to, um, is there any um, sort of development in terms of um, this organic photovoltaics to be in the market, when would be the likelihood of the time, time scale of that? Um, believe it or not, at the moment, there are some, some of these uh, modules are al already ready. Um, in, chi in China, they have developed that, and uh, there are, uh, in China and Brazil. And uh, these are around 6% efficient. Now, um, if you've got large space that you could actually um, have them it, it would be fantastic you can do that uh, but nevertheless if you want to go to a higher efficient that means to go to uh, beyond 10 percent uh, at the moment there's nobody uh, have achieved that or beyond 10 percent at the large scale 
Um, I would think that would take uh, probably um, three, four years that is, is doable. Um, we, we, do, we are working um, towards it at the moment and uh, we are hoping that that breakthrough will come within the next uh, three to four years. Um, that is the uh, answer to, the, uh, to my sort of questions. Um, at this stage, I would like to thank everyone for um, uh, joining us on this event and it has been uh, uh, absolutely exciting for us to um, open this research centre and we love um, many of you to contact us to, uh, to have collaboration with you. Um, we are on the uh, university website and all our details are available. Um, if you would like to uh, collaborate and come around and have a look at our facilities, uh, it, would, it is really uh, uh, appreciated. Thank you very much. And at this stage, I'm concluding the, uh, the whole session. Thank you very much.